thank you so much everyone for joining me on Bang to Write on the Facebook page this evening. We are joined today by a veteran Bang to Writer, Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi. And also literary agent Julian Friedman, who is talking to Mark and me as well about um, should screenwriters write novels? Because, of course, in the Bang to Write tribe and in the teachable uh, courses and all the uh, people that email me and, and message me on a regular basis, I know a lot of you who started out in screenwriting have now become very interested in novels, um, just as I have in the last five to six years as well um so a lot of you are thinking well is there any way that we can exploit our storytelling skills as screenwriters in to writing novels and the answer as far as julian is concerned is a big fat yes is that right julian it certainly is um, um i mean many of you know that i've i've been talking about this for some years now I think the first time I spoke about it may have even been at the Cheltenham Screenwriters Festival, which has got to be more than 10 years ago. Um, basically, you know, I, I've worked with, I worked in publishing for many years, then I started doing film and TV. And I feel that writers should be storytellers, primarily. In other words, I don't think they should be so focused on either writing novels or scripts. And I think the moment you take the focus away from having to write a script, which is a very technical document, and you focus more on how to tell the story in the best possible way, in my experience, writers get into a much better place. And I say this for several reasons. Firstly, most writers, uh, script writers, have probably read more novels than they've read screenplays. Um, secondly, you can describe what a character thinks in a novel, which is very hard to do elegantly in a screenplay. And you can describe what a character feels in a novel. Again, harder to do elegantly in a screenplay. Uh, if you want any more reasons, I'd add that most screenwriters just do not know how the publishing industry works and how to get it to work for them. Nor do they know that usually book writers, and it's a generalization, but book writers earn more money than screenwriters. So I can understand why screenwriters who have worked really hard to understand how the film and television industry works and how screenplay structure works feel daunted or feel um, that having to write a novel is, is, is not something they really want to do. Now, what I'm about to talk about is based in part on the chapter in in my in the first book in my series that's the one on creative strategies um the second one and that's now available as an ebook but not as a print book is on business strategies and the third one which will come out in a few months is on negotiating skills and contracts so why do books earn more money than scripts well there are actually many reasons but let's start from the fact that there are many more books published than scripts produced. So statistically, the chances of a book earning you some money is greater than of your script earning you some money. Even if you treated every single soap episode, so like four Coronation Streets and four EastEnders, as the equivalent, each of them as the equivalent of book, there are still more books published than there are uh, scripts produced. The second reason, which is, I think, a killer argument, books can sell many times over. So you can sell British rights, French rights, American rights, Japanese rights for the same book. You, having written the book, you don't have to do anything else. Either your publisher sells the rights on your behalf or your agent does. And the really successful novelists can get 20, 30 or even 40 contracts per book. And every one of them brings in an advance. Now, the advances in some small countries may be very small, but they do add up. I think it was now, uh, Christie is the most translated writer. Isn't that right, Julian? Oh, she may well be. Um, she may well be. I mean, our record at Blake Friedman is uh, 
I think, 42 languages for wow. one book. Wow. So That's script writers tell stories in a particular format, in Courier 12 point, usually in three acts. And the significant word here is stories. Um, when I've been teaching, which I've been doing for over 30 years, I've often asked classes, why, why have you chosen to be a scriptwriter? Because frankly, I think it's a highly risky job. Yeah. And most scriptwriters become scriptwriters because they're really passionate about movies and TV or stage or theatre. Uh, they love watching them. They kind of are drawn to wanting to work in that arena and therefore they assume I should be a screenwriter. And they spend a lot of time trying to get to grips with all the technicalities of the three act structure and the complex and often inscrutable legal and contractual aspects of doing business as a screenwriter. And I know many writers are puzzled at the endless disputes between the screenwriting experts. Is, are there really three acts or are there 22 steps or are there 12 stages and so on and so forth? Actually, I believe it's really simple. The people who argue that it's not as simple as three acts, but they're 22 steps or 12 stages, they uh, are wrong in the sense that actually what they're talking about is still three acts. Anyway, there, where there are hundreds of books about writing scripts and hundreds of courses, long, short, degree courses, two-hour courses, um, they don't generally concentrate on the art and the craft of storytelling. They focus much more on script writing. But if the story doesn't work as a story, it doesn't matter how beautifully typed the script is, it ain't gonna work. Um, I think it was, uh, uh, God, who was one of those American satirical writers, Truman Capote, I think, said of Jack Kerouac's 1950s or whatever, novel um, on the road said this is not writing this is typing mm -hmm. um, so having worked with both book and script writers for so many years I believe that the majority of writers are actually stronger prose writers than script writers mm -hmm. and I understand why they daunted about the idea of attempting to write a novel apart from the fact that they have no idea how the public industry works the first reason that many writers have given me for i don't really want to try a novel is because they're very long so the average novel has 80 to ninety thousand words the average script has about 25 to thirty thousand words and yes you do need to understand how publishing works if you want to get the most out of it and you don't have an agent but there are ways around that so why do i think screenwriters who are still intending on and intent on and actively becoming screenwriters or making even making a living as screenwriters should write prose um you know they've you when you've read novels as a kid and as a teenager uh, into your adulthood you are taking in subliminally almost an awful lot of valuable information and you don't have to worry about acts and act breaks and sequences and scenes and beats and so on. You can also bear in mind that you can use the book as a template for a movie. Mm -hmm. Remember that if you are writing a book about huge battle scenes with thousands of tanks and planes and so on, it doesn't cost any more to publish the book. Whereas your screenplay might cost $120 million. Mm -hmm. So, you can do that. You can also get much more deeply into the minds, feelings, emotions of the characters. Alexandra McKendrick, whom some of you may know, um, who is the director of great classic movies like The Lady Killers, said, do not try to work out a story in script form, do it in prose. Now, the other advantage is I think it's easier to get a publisher for a manuscript than a producer for a script. Interestingly, a lot of producers have a huge respect for novels and actually much more respect than they have for screenplays. They do, that's my experience as well. Yeah, and, and I think there's a really interesting reason for that. 
I don't think most producers can read scripts. But they can read prose. Now, if you can't find a publisher to sell the manuscript, you can self-publish. And we can talk a bit more about this. Lucy knows more than I do. I've only just jumped into the self-publishing world, but I'm finding it absolutely fascinating. And once you've worked out your story in prose, you've gone deep into your characters, you've got really interesting, complex characters, you're halfway to having something relatively easy to adapt into a film or television series. And should a producer make you an offer to option your manuscript or if it's published your book, then one of your conditions will be that you will option it to them on condition that you get to write script. Mm -hmm. So if you do get a regular publisher to make you an offer, do not under any circumstances allow them to have the dramatization rights. Keep those, it's called reserved rights. You simply say, I'm a screenwriter, I'm keeping publishing rights. Actually, uh, sorry, uh, film and television. You should also keep stage rights, radio rights as well. No reason why the publisher should have them. On the other hand, if you have no idea how to go about selling those subsidiary rights and the publisher has got someone in their company who does that, this is assuming you don't have an agent, then let the publisher do it, they'll take a cut. Now, for any of you who are really serious about getting into publishing, I strongly recommend you read the late Carol Blake's book called From Pitch to Publication, a best-selling book about the business of publishing. It's um, out of print, so you'll have to pick up a copy secondhand, but that should be very easy to do. It is a bit out of date, but actually I looked at it recently and even though it is a bit out of date all the essentials are there it's the best book on how to work the publishing industry so I'm, I'm not going to go into details in this short introduction on the publishing industry but if you've got questions I'm really happy to answer them okay suffice it to say you can research editors for a particular genre if you look in the acknowledgments of most books the, the author will have almost always acknowledged their editor and if they've got an agent, their agent. And a little bit of industrial espionage will reveal the format of their the publishing company email addresses. Or you just call the reception and say, I need to send an email to editor, you know, whatever the name is, and they'll usually the give it to as you. As well can be really useful. You know, sometimes a lot of editors, a lot of agents, a lot of people in that world, in the publishing world in particular, hang out on Twitter. And sometimes yeah. they actually have pitch parties on Twitter. There is one really famous one called Pit Mad, hashtag P-I-T. MAD um, and a lot of people um, will actually make submissions to agents and editors in specific kind of scenarios, specific genres, specific characters that are called out and stuff like that. And these pitch parties, they happen every month, every single month. They do have an American bent. There aren't as many British um, uh, people taking part in them, um, but there's no reason that British writers can't. Yeah. You know, the, the other thing which you have to do, which you really must do, is you must check out the websites of the publishers. And if they have, and the same if, you, if you're thinking of approaching an agency, check out their websites and follow their submission guidelines. So how do you submit a book proposal? Well, it's not 100 miles away from submitting a film or TV series proposal. Let's say you've polished your opening chapters I would say the minimum you should write is 30, 30 pages, 50 would be better. Uh, you've polished the synopsis, you've had your friends and your enemies read it and give you notes. You put it away for a while and then you bring it out and you polish it again. And now you're ready to submit. Now, uh, editors are fairly obsessed with writers having big social media footprints. I've heard that some editors will not consider a manuscript from a writer who has no website, no is not on Twitter, is not on Facebook, is not on Instagram, it's not on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, I get why that is. Um, 
because there's very well established evidence that readers of books really, really like to be able to be connected to the author. When I first went to the um, Crime Writers Conference, there was this, this huge tent. And after each of the kind of guest crime writer speakers had done their session, they went into the tent and there were queues of like 100 people clutching half a dozen hardback books, waiting to get them signed. And I was speaking to one of these people and I said, um, oh, I see you've got all six, you've got six, of, this is Peter James was doing, six of Peter's books there. Have you not read them before? Oh, I've got them all at home. I said, well, whose are these for? Oh, no, they're for me. Um, I want to have them signed. Now, I think that's kind of really cool. And it reminded me once, I was a huge fan of a thriller writer in the 60s and 70s called Desmond Bagley. And I had all his books. And I was driving up to university uh, in York, and I stopped to get petrol at a petrol station. And in the petrol station was a dump bin. And Collins had just reissued a few of his books with new covers. I bought them all, even though I already had them. Yeah. So I get it. And therefore, um, I would say that if you are serious about becoming a, a book writer, you really, really need to get onto social media. Have a website, make yourself interesting, check out other writers' websites and find out which approaches you like. Be on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and then there are a whole bunch that I... I'm, I'm too old to have caught up with. I would recommend that you blog a mo every month a little essay or review of a, a book you read that you really enjoyed. The real key to this is to praise people. If your blogs are always savaging other writers, it's not going to help you. Um, on Twitter, for example, follow all the writers in your genre whom you respect and admire. And if they tweet something interesting, comment on it. Be interesting yourselves. And if you come across useful information like, you know, I, I for instance, often post articles on Twitter that I get out of The Guardian because some of The Guardian articles are really, really interesting. If you post interesting and useful information, you will build up a following. Constant self-promotion results in being unfollowed. Absolutely. And then depending depending uh, on your I'm genre. Just, just, to, just to add to that, because uh, Julian gave this, uh, gave this advice to me when we was at the LSF, when we had a similar session there. And I've been following it, and I've noticed that uh, my engagement's increased and followers. But I've also noticed as well, purely by accident that I'm getting far more engagement on LinkedIn and more serious players just accepting my friend request than than on on Twitter. But yeah well, LinkedIn I think re LinkedIn is by far the most professional. Oh yeah. Uh, and you know you don't tend to get a lot of kind of sort of silly you know wannabes who who are just playing at this. Um, but I think all of them are important. But also if you if you're going to try and write novels and you've never written a novel before, think very, very carefully about what genre um, you're going to write. And now it may be that you have aspirations to write very literary novels, which is great. Um, uh, but if you are writing, say, romantic novels, join the Romantic Novelists Association, go along to their events, meet up with the members there. If you are writing crime, join whatever crime writers organizations or events there's a, a crime writers day in bristol i think yeah, and there's the West. Yeah. yeah and there's the conference in harrogate which is terrific absolutely wonderful um you know and and the the generic book writing organization or writing organization for book writers is the society of authors if you're writing screenplays it's the writers guild Certainly, the earlier in the, in the formative years of your career, it can pay off enormously to join the relevant organizations, meet people, and learn from. The, I mean, the Writers Guild is fantastic for script writers. Every Writers Guild contract, approved contract, is on the website. Actually, you don't even have to be a member to access those, but it is a great organization, as is the Society of Authors for Novelists.
So I just want to quickly finish my little bit by saying a few words about self-publishing. Um, I wrote my first book about screenwriting about 28 years ago, I can't 30 years ago. And um, the publisher I was with decided to stop doing books like that. So I brought out a new edition with a, uh, another publisher. And I didn't think they did a really good job. I didn't like the format. I didn't like the, the, the way they laid it out. I didn't like their pricing. I didn't like their lack of promotion. And so when sales stopped, I got the rights back. Um, there are some publishers who do books about script writing and they do them kind of cheap and cheerful. Uh, and I think rather well. I mean, Lucy's had a number of books published like that. But I've been intrigued by the stories that some of my clients who are self-publishing their novels have been telling me. Um, at first, I didn't really believe it. Um, I was told about this guy who wrote, who wrote um, moderately okay crime novels. They were not great, 150 pages. He did one every month. And he was earning more than a hundred grand a year, a hundred thousand pounds a year. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, if you're going to write a novel in a month, if you work um, five day weeks, four weeks a month, that's 20 days, 160 pages, eight pages a day. It's not actually, mm -hmm. I mean, the first one may take you longer while you build up the world of the story and the, and the characters, and you, you know, you build up the supporting characters who will repeat in each book. But you know, that's not that's not a huge amount of work. Mm -hmm. And I was told about a couple of guys who are now into their, you know, they published more than 50, 60 books, who are earning a million, if these are Americans, I believe, a million dollars a year. And the reason that I it clicked and I, I did believe it is because. One of my clients, the screenwriter, used to write horror novels, and no one at Blake Friedman wanted to read them. Sadly, we're not into horror novels at Blake Friedman. And he was complaining to me that, that all the little publishers who published his horror novels, you know, they would sell 500 copies. He never made any money. And I remember saying to him, Paul, you were a policeman, for God's sake. Why don't you write a crime novel? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, uh, all right. So I gave him a couple of our clients' books. And he wrote a crime novel, which I have to say was a kind of mashup between a crime novel and a horror novel. Yeah, it was pretty horrifying. <laughs> it was very violent. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I dutifully sent it to all the crime editors in town. And all of them, bar one, turned it down. Some of them saying, oh, it was so gruesome, I couldn't even finish it. And the publisher who, bought, who made an offer, a publisher called Avon, who are an imprint of HarperCollins, and when I told my book colleagues that Paul and I were delighted we got one offer from Avon, they said, oh, you don't want to go to Avon. They, their contracts are awful. Their advances are small. Their royalties are terrible. And they do not sell books to bookshops. I said, well, where the hell do they sell books? They said they sell them to supermarkets. And they sell them on the Internet. Now, Paul, they wanted Paul to deliver a book every six months. He said, I can do that easily. So they published the first one on a Valentine's Day, which is really weird. If you knew what the story, like the story was gruesome. That is weird. Yeah, very weird. <laughs> Six that. months later, they published the second one. Six months later, they published the third one. So in three years, they'd actually published three novels. And about two months, three months after the third one came out, they rang me to say, we thought you and Paul would like to know. We've just notched up sales of over 500,000 copies. Now, most of them, I'd say three quarters, were ebooks. Uh, and I looked into, I said, how did you do it? Because no one in the office believed, they are, that's bullshit. Um, in those days, publishers had different access to Amazon. Uh, from authors, they were able to play around with pricing and special 
promotions and so on. That doesn't quite work like that anymore. But we had a we had a, uh, an intern who became our our expert on Amazon Kindle because we had a couple of authors who wanted to be pub who wanted to self publish, and I didn't know anything about it. No, no one else. This was like ten more years ago. One of them was um, Paul Bassett Davis, who wanted to publish this novel, and so we said to Victoria, "Okay, you've got two weeks." end of two weeks, you have to know everything there is to know about it. And she was brilliant. And Paul's novel did really well. We had um, dead authors whose books were just languishing, doing nothing. She put all their stuff up. And then she said to us, you know, there's nothing more for me to put online on Kindle. And we were kind of thinking, well, what do we give her to do? And then she she came in one morning and she said, I've got some very good, but not very good news. I said, what are you talking about? Thinking she's going to say she was pregnant or something. She said, um, I'm afraid I'm going to give in my resignation. I said, oh, why? We don't want you to leave. She said, well, I've just been poached by Amazon. Mm. She was so good at it. So um, I've talked to her a lot, and I've also looked at the vast amount of stuff online. Essentially, if you want to make it work, you've got to publish lots of books over a year or two-year period. You don't have to do one a month. But I think, you know, you need to be able to do two, three, four a year. And you then play around with pricing when you offer a book free. You offer a book free when you bring out a new book that you've got, you, you are charging for. Um, one of the lessons I learned was you publish a book the day before Christmas and you publish a book the day that Apple release a new iPad. Because there are 100 million people around the world who will have this new sh- shiny tablet and they're going to want to download free stuff and if they find your book and they start reading it and they like it the wonderful thing about amazon is if they if they download your book free from amazon as soon as you bring out a book that has to be paid for amazon will tell them Mm -hmm. and say you you bought you downloaded you know julian's book or lucy's book if you liked it there's a new one and it's on special offer for three days and basically you just manipulate so i would say for starters spend 20 percent of your time building your social media platform once you've started publishing once you've got two three four books out you spend another 10 percent of your time playing gaming the amazon system uh which is something i'm not very good at but i know there are people who are you can download books i mean i i i belong to kindle unlimited and i download tons of books about how to make Kindle work for you. Uh, And the other thing I discovered that a lot of book writers don't have a clue about, they don't know what Kindle Unlimited is, which is weird. Um, Kindle Unlimited means you pay them about 10 quid a month and you can have any 10 books for free at any time. Any books that they've got for free. If you want an 11th one, you have to give them one back. So you can do that. And every time you read a page of a Kindle Unlimited book, Amazon makes a note of it and pays a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a penny to the author. I can't remember the figure. I think Amazon puts up about $180 million every month to pay the Kindle Unlimited author reads. And a lot of authors earn more money from that than from anything else. So I think there's a a lot of really, really good reasons Mm -hmm. for self-publishing, but equally and there's much more kudos in being published by a mainstream publisher there's a a website you must check out i think it's a facebook group 20 books to 50k we'll put this on the yeah on the chat yeah it's absolutely fascinating people are very generous and explain where they went wrong when they were self-publishing and people explain where they went right and you can learn a lot and you can also ask questions just don't self-promote And it's one of the most generous Facebook groups I've ever come across. So if you've got a group... It is incredible. Uh, Julian recommended this to me as well, and I've just shared it in the chat. But I've been a a member for about a month or two now, and they are, like Julian was saying, they will share, say, like the monthly sales figures. And some of them will just make $100, but some will be making a lot. And then they'll tell you how they did it. 
they'll tell you exactly how they did it and they'll share all these like techniques and all these marketing strategies they followed and it's really really good so it's well worth checking out i mean if i if i for some reason had to stop being an agent uh and still wanted to earn a living it's exactly what i would do but uh, let me finish with this one thing if you've got an original script that you've not been able to get produced but you think it's a really strong story because other people have told you and not not your your partner or your mum or whatever but people who are hard-nosed um maybe not as hard-nosed as lucy but hard-nosed and you know it's sitting there and it's never it's never been made have a look at it and think could could that work as a book and then write some chapters and then t- put that into your reading group and get people to tell you you know, is your style good? Is it good enough? And if you can't find a publisher, and it's hard to find a publisher unless you've written a complete book, most most editors won't consider a partial manuscript from someone unless they've got a really big track record in some other area. But I just want to tell you an anecdote. Many, many years ago, I was in LA, and I bumped into a guy who had just... Um, uh, had his first big kind of biggish Hollywood deal. And I said, how did you get it? He said, well, he said, I'm a graphic designer. I've spent the last 20 years doing posters for all the Hollywood studios. Most of the posters, which, you know, you see iconic posters, he said, we designed. And he said, one day we decided to come up with some radical new designs. And we we made up a kind of, fake poster i mean it was a poster for a film that didn't exist and we sent it to a lot of the companies we weren't working for but we wanted to get as clients and one of them called up and said can we read the script and i said well there isn't a script there's just a fake poster and they said well can you come in and see us we want to make the film do you want to write the script and of course there is a story which i think is well known about a guy who failed to sell his script and it was for kind of science fiction, the action thriller. And he managed to get a comic book, a graphic novel publisher to do it as a graphic novel. And within days of the graphic novel being published, he had an offer for the feature film rights, which just goes to show producers can't read. They like pictures. (laughs) So I, 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 you know, I think, as I say, I go back to what I started with. I think that if you think of yourself primarily as a storyteller, you will you will you will write better stories. There's a really interesting book by Bruno Bettelheim. It's an old book, but it's really really interesting. Called the Uses of Enchantment, and he's a sort of socio- sociologist, and it's a book about how fairy tales, and I think nursery rhymes, affect children. And it's an incredibly pure look at the power of storytelling. And you don't have to worry about the format. But if you can get, if you can get the audience, whoever it is, emotionally engaged, and if you think of a children's birthday parties, I've now got uh, 12 grandchildren. So we go, we, we go to birthday parties all the time. And they always have these entertainers. And it's fascinating to watch the entertainer surrounded by a bunch of five, six, seven, eight-year-olds, all of whom have ADHD, all of whom are frantic, and they're completely mesmerized. And it's not by what is being said, it's by the way it's being said. And it's by the way it engages them and draws them in. And I think that one of the problems with learning to be a screenwriter is I don't think screenwriting courses or books are that useful because they basically try and explain in their own individual way, which has got to be a little bit different from Rob McKee or John Truby or whoever, whoever, this is how you should do it. And that kind of prescriptive stuff I think is, is really bad. It doesn't necessarily work and we can go into more detail. Um, And what I've tried to do in, in the first volume of my, um, of the new books is uh, the opening chapters are uh, how to grab your audience 
and the psychology of emotion. Because if you are able to grab the interest of, and, and twist the emotions of the audience, you've got gold dust. And it's very difficult to do if you aren't deliberately setting out to do it. Mm. <coughs> you know, I once read a, I once was approached by a very, very established writer whose agent had retired. And he said, would we be interested in taking him on? And I said, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, he'd written 200 hours of television. And, you know, he was huge. And I said, could I read some of your scripts? And in a very offended voice, he said, don't you know what I've written? And I said, well, I've seen a lot of your stuff, but to be honest, I'd rather read one of the scripts. I've never read any of your scripts. And he said, well, that's quite a good answer. And I was lying at home on the sofa. My wife was sitting in the living room reading, and there was some music on. And I suddenly, out of somewhere, heard her voice saying, why are you crying? And I said, what, what? And I, I touched my cheeks. And I didn't even realize I was crying. And it was because he'd written the best ending to any piece of drama I've ever come across. I used to use this as an example when I was teaching pitching, but I began to get kind of fed up with the fact that if I try and describe it, I'll cry, even though I've described it a hundred times. And I said to him, did you kind of deliberately plan it? He said, look, I've been writing for 40 years. No, I didn't. I just know that at the end, you've got to create a situation in which the audience is expecting one thing and you give them something else. And what you give them has got to be better than they could ever have imagined. And I don't think most writers actually think about how our emotional systems work or think about how to play the emotions like you're playing on a guitar of the audience. And if you don't think about it, you're not going to do it. Mm. And I think that writing prose, where you're allowed to describe what characters are thinking and feeling, you're much more likely to delve deeper into, into the emotions. Mm. So yeah, I think I, there was that quote, wasn't there? No tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. Oh, I didn't know that one. That's a nice I, one. I can't remember who said it now. It might have been Hemingway or somebody like that. Mm. So, because it's nice and succinct. Mm. So it sounds like it would be him. But um, are we going to go over to some questions from uh, Mark, uh, Julian? Or have you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah there, there were some good questions, difficult questions, I have to say. They weren't really easy to answer, but I thought they were quite good. Yeah. yeah. Shoot, Mark. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so, so Mark, over to you. Yeah, so you have kind of covered some of the elements in it, but say, um, if you are, you know, you're primarily used to writing screenplays um, and you want to have a go at writing prose, uh, what can you discover in writing prose that cannot, you've already described that it could kind of advance your career, but what can you use in prose to actually enrich your screenplays, you know, so you can get something back from it that you can actually put into the screenplay? Um, I think the main one is simply you will have better characters because you have met, you have much, you have more tools to work with. Um, you know, uh, I was once told that a good actor, when they read a script, uh, doesn't look at the number of lines that they've been given. They look at what there is for them to do when they are not speaking. So I think the problem with prose writers, with the script writers, in a way, is that they it's much more difficult to show what's going on emotionally within the character. I also think a lot of people who write scripts actually um, are better at developing stories, which because they develop them in a treatment, they are developing them in prose. And then when you get the script version, it's, yeah, it's not quite as good. So what are the elements, the basic elements you've got, whatever you're writing, are characters, actions, and dialogue. Uh, and because you can describe thoughts and feelings in prose, which you can't do in a screenplay, um, you're going to do them, I think, with more nuance. They're going to be more interesting. They're going to be more complex. Um, ex externalizing thoughts and feelings in a screenplay is very, very difficult. I think the book that I thought 
did that best with Michael Haig's book called Writing Screenplays That Sell. But the process of trying to externalize, I show rather than tell. Because if if you have a character saying, oh, you know, I what I was thinking about was, then it's very expositional and that's kind of horrible. Um, so I don't think that, I don't think that it's a question of what elements can you take out. I just think you're more likely to develop more interesting characters. Um, and as I say, in my experience, at the beginning of their careers as screenwriters, most people write better prose than they write scripts. I have to tell you, that's true of myself. In lockdown, I wrote my first ever script. Uh, I worked out the backstories, the characters, everything else, and I shared it with a few people. They all said it's great. I then downloaded Final Draft, wrote the script. I thought it was terrific until my friends pointed out how rubbish it was. <laughs> so I do know what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> I bet it wasn't rubbish. You should let me it read it, Julian. <laughs> but are you welcome to if you've got spare time? Um, no, I think they were right. I think they were right. I mean, I was still trying to work out stuff in doing the script. I hadn't really worked it out. Um, the also the scary thing took three days to write. And I thought, can't be that easy. And I think it's right. It wasn't that easy. Anyway, what was the next question? Well, I was just going to ask Lucy, did, did you start with prose or did you start with screenplays? Well, I mean, it depends really what, what you what you define as um, start, really. I mean, I did I did publish a book years ago when I was in my early 20s that was horrifically bad. And thank God it came out before the Kindle because nobody knows about it and nobody can read it. I've got a box in my house of this book. It's so bad. <laughs> I was like reading it, it was like, no. Um, so yeah, it, I, and I always used to write books when I was a child, but really they were like, you know, 14 pages of my maths home book, homework book, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, in real terms, I did probably start, I got paid money for writing things like treatments and, um, you know, I got a few options and things like that. And I did a lot of freelance writing as well. So, yeah, I guess I guess it's a it's a mix. It's always been a mix for me, really, if I think about it. And um, and then, of course, I went in hard to screenwriting as a script editor more because I've always preferred script editing to actual screenwriting, to be quite honest with you. Writing scripts, it's just it's a bit of a it's a bit of a pain in the butt, really. I just I don't I don't get it. I just I, I just you know, it's like the actual act of writing a script. It's like, why would you torture yourself like this? I don't I don't understand. <laughs> why do I feel that way about all writing, to be honest, when I'm writing my first drafts of my novels as well? It's like, kill me now. Ah. You know, I just I uh, there's that other quote as well. It says that um, writing is harder for writers than any other person and I feel I feel like that about writing yeah. I feel like I hate writing but I also love it but I also really hate it I have this love-hate relationship with it so I'm not the the short version is Mark I have no idea I don't right. know I don't no. know <laughs> there, there, there isn't it because that I was going to say there might be a lot of writers out there who have written screenplays only and they've learned that craft you know to be lean to be succinct to create as much white space as possible mm. and I was wondering if you you two had any tips for people who are a bit nervous about how to switch to writing a bit more creatively and having mm -hmm. like a lot more space to play around with with the words well I mean the average, the average book is like three times as long as a, as a feature screenplay isn't it Julian so it's I think a lot of writers and certainly a lot of bangers who've come to me and they want me to help them write a novel when they've been writing screenplays is they write a lot of filler they just put like loads of random stuff in there um and they think it's about time and it's not about time it's about you know if screenplay is a psychological i you know what you see is what you get then novels are also what you see is what you get as well because that's really important to remember. You need to be as visual as possible in your, in your screenplay as well. And you need to do word pictures like Doris Lessing always used to say. Um, but at the same time, you have got that psychology as well. And, you, and time is more elastic in a novel 
than in, in screenplay in screenplays you've got to account for everything you know somebody's somebody goes into a gas station they can't possibly in the next um uh space be in a different place when we know that it's the same day and stuff like that you've got to make accounts for all of those kind of things in screenwriting you just don't have to do that in novels time is elastic um and that's how to and remembering that um actually stops you from writing loads of filler drivel of people having to drive places or walk down the street for ages for no reason and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I'd like I'd like to say something which I think is, a lot of people would disagree with me on. Um, there's a kind of conventional wisdom that if you're writing a I don't know a crime thriller uh, or a romantic novel or whatever, you shouldn't read writers who are writing the same genre in case you are somehow influenced by their style. I actually think that's a load of crap. Oh, yeah. um, I think that if there's a writer who's, um, you know, genre writers generally don't have a, a very, uh, very authorial style. I mean, they do have certain things. Peter James writes very short chapters. Now, if you read a Peter James novel, if you think about it, you'll realize the short chapters create a great deal of tension. And there's no reason why you shouldn't do that too. I actually think that if you are writing prose for the first time, that you should do this. You should read, you should find a writer whose style you like, um, whose style is successful, and you should copy it. Um, because most of them don't have a, you know, if you took two paragraphs from 20 contemporary crime novelists, okay, someone might guess Elmore Leonard <laughs> or Dashiell Hamlet, but I don't think anyone would guess Agatha Christie, except it's probably the worst written paragraph, because uh, she wasn't actually a very good writer in terms of her, you know, literary style. But in general, I think you need to find your own comfort zone. And I think the best way to do that is to look at the, the writers you like and write your story, but try and think that they were writing it and see how that goes. If you find it uncomfortable, change, do something else, do so. But but don't don't get too don't get don't worry about it too much. You know, um, uh, you know. I think that most most people aged, you know, more than fifteen, have read enough novels to actually be relatively fluent at it. Um, some do a lot of adverbs and adjectives, and as Lucy was saying, beautiful pictures, word pictures. You can you can visualize it. I had a client once who sent me a, a script which was. 200 pages long and I said I'm not going to read this it's 200 pages long she said well, I know but I've written it almost as I was the director and the cameraman and I was trying to make you see what I was seeing I did read it I have to say it was unbelievably good and I felt rather mean saying to her but I can't send it out you're going to have to do the kind of professional 100, 120 pages before I sent it out, because no one else is going to be as indulgent as I was. So I'm not sure that you need to do an awful lot other than try and see what works and and do it and have a go. Yeah. I mean, I certainly, my, my novel that I've written, I was basically um, Terry Pratchett. I was trying to be Terry Pratchett as I wrote it because I love his style and I've read all his books several times and I'm, I was lucky enough to meet the man twice. So it was hard not to write in that style. Whether I achieved it or not is another matter, but I certainly found it easier to write in that style. I think I, I think you did exactly the right thing. Um, I'll ask one more and then maybe we have a few more questions, but let's say that you've written a screenplay and you think this would make a great novel. I'm going to use this as my first one to have a go at. With regards to plotting, is the screenplay and the outline you wrote for that perfect for the novel, or is it a completely different craft? You need to kind of write something new from scratch. 
before you write the novel? No, I think I think if you've got a screenplay, you should deconstruct it into what we will now call chapters. So you need to decide how how, how long your chapters are going to be, um, and work out roughly how many chapters there are. Now you could very crudely say, in a three act, um, in three acts you've got. Um, you know, 20, uh, 25 pages for your first act, 25 pages for your th third act, uh, essentially two parts in each. So you've got four parts. So you've got eight. You could have eight chapters just like that. Um, I, I, think, I, think it, I think if you deconstruct it into a prose document, I mean, I, 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 I've always loved the fact that if you read Winnie the Pooh, It'll say, you know, chapter four in which Pooh does this, chapter five in which Eeyore does this, whatever. Um, that's fine. You know, this is this is hidden stuff which no one except you needs to look at. I mean, it's not true. If one of my clients is going to write a novel, they will usually write a, a sort of synopsis. And in fact, there is a very, uh, I mean, something I've been teaching for years and years, um, and it's, it's something we tried and tested in Blake Friedman or with a lot of clients, which is basically um, a document which has four parts to it. Um, you have a, a cover page. Then you have the first part, which is the pitch. Now, if you would go into a big bookstore, go to the top 10 best paperback bestsellers and stand there and read the back cover of the top 10 bestsellers, you'll discover there is a generic way of pitching, which I think, and I, I use this, and I think writers, screenwriters should use it when they're working out how to pitch their scripts, but certainly for novels, the generic way, it doesn't tell you the story. It tells you what kind of story it is. It, it, it refers to other bestsellers, which the, the, the readers of which loved, if they love that, they'll love this. Um, so it, it's a, it's a, it's hype. It promises you an experience. I would then do uh, character biographies, uh, not very long, five lines for a main character, two for a, for a minor character. And there's a very good reason for this, which I'll explain in a minute. The, the third section of this document is what I call the statement of intent. What is your intention? Why are you writing it? Why are you the right person to write this? And why is this the right thing for you to be writing? The reason I, I, I need that information is because I have to know why my client wants to write something. I want to know what their connection is to it. I want to know that they've got a passion for it because they're going to need that because whatever they are writing is going to be a long journey. And the fourth section is the synopsis. Now, uh, for, a, for a movie it's essential that that synopsis is written in the present tense because the reader is then forced to imagine that they're seeing it. And if you can get your, the reader of your prose document to actually imagine that they're seeing it because it's written in the present tense, you'll be, you'll be doing a really good thing. For a novel, you don't have to do it in the present tense, but I would. And the reason for having taken the character biographies out of it, for one reason, is so that you don't clutter up the synopsis. So, for example, the example I use, the novel opens with a man jogging along a beach and there's a dog running around him and we then go to a close-up where the dog is digging in the sand and then an extreme close-up where we see the rotting skeleton of a hand sticking out of the sand. Okay. So present tense gives it immediacy. Secondly, I didn't describe the man. I didn't describe the beach. I didn't describe the sea. I didn't describe the sky. I didn't describe the dog. Why? Because everyone who reads that will make up their own picture, which is fine because then they are becoming engaged in the process of imagining what it is you're writing about. If you were to say, 
the novel opens with a man jogging along the sea. His name is John Smith. He's 38 years old. So he got thrown out of Oxford because he was accused of plagiarizing an essay. Well, you say, oh, God. So is he in mid-step? Has he run another? You know, it's very difficult to, to take in the action. So by taking all the character backstory and biographies out of the synopsis, you write a much more dynamic synopsis. Someone once said, well, how would you synopsize the car chase in... What's that wonderful movie in San Francisco with Steve McBullet? Oh, you know, there's a, like a seven minute or whatever car chase. Fabulous. I say you would just say there is a, an incredible seven minute car chase up and down the rolling hills of San Francisco, you know, which will you won't breathe for seven minutes. That's fine. So the point of this document, I find, and we... We tested it on editors and publishing companies. We tested it on producers. We tested it on writers. Is it actually enables the writer to create a document which does a lot more than the average treatment outline synopsis? And one of the benefits I discovered is that editors and publishing companies and producers, if they have a choice into which order to read the different categories of information, they vary wildly. I never read the character biographies. Some people only will only do it by starting with the character biographies. So you enable the reader to actually, in their own view, improve their experience of reading this document. And they'll come away with a much more, much clearer sense. And what that ultimately means is that you go from that if they say yeah we like this then then they, they will commission instead of your three page synopsis it should never be more than three pages in this document in this kind of selling process they'll commission a 10 or a 15 or a 20 page synopsis mm -hmm. uh if it's a treatment it'll be for a film if, you know. so there are ways of actually trying to work out what categories of information do i need to give somebody to encourage them to want to work with me and i find when i get sent a treatment which is a mishmash of character biographies backstory bits of action then a bit more backstory then a bit more character biography i i can't read it i literally cannot read it mm -hmm. and it might be a brilliant story and this might be a brilliant writer so i think there's a lot you can do to improve the way you present your ideas. And this is one which has to say, we, we spent a lot of time in research on. Carol and I did it over a period of months by literally analyzing all the treatments and pitches we got, which worked and all the ones which didn't. And we tried to work out what was it that made the ones that work work. Yeah, anyway. I, would, I would say something similar. I mean, so often I'm reading a treatment or an outline or, or people call them an outline or a treatment and it's just like what is this you know because it's just it's literally all over the place and yeah. and it's got so much backstory and that's like the the killer of most um outlines and stories because the writer but, but lucy the backstory is absolutely essential but you that it doesn't have to be part of what you Put in if, if your characters have no backstory, your characters will be two dimensional. Mm. Yes. Um, you know, I when I when I we're quite often uh, at the agency we're we're sent scripts by producers. They can't get the writer to make the script work, and they say, "Have we got someone who can make it work?" And so, usually Conrad or I would read the script, and I'd say seven times out of ten. Um, what becomes clear is that there is no backstory mm. and that, or that the backstory, the, the, there are problems in the backstory. If you can fix them in the backstory, then the film works. The difficult question for writers is wh where do you draw the line between the backstory and the first action of your movie? Yeah. yeah it's and tough. most writers start much too early. Mm -hmm. And the old dictum is you you start as late as possible and you end as early as possible. But start starting late doesn't mean you don't have to write 150 pages. 
-hmm. of notes about the characters and the background and the research and so on. It's choosing where to start. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a there was a famous novel in the uh, 60s, Mary McCarthy, The Group. Mm -hmm. And um, someone once said, you know, incredibly difficult to make a movie of it. And what they did was they just made a movie of one weekend when all these characters happened to come together. So a lot of the backstory didn't appear in the film. But because there was a book which had fantastic characters in it, because there was backstory, it worked. So that, that's a really interesting subject. Where, do you, where is the latest point you can start your story? Mm. Yeah, um, I think it was my friend Sally Abbott, who's written for like Vera and yeah. EastEnders and all that other kind of stuff. She says that backstory is, has to um, uh, play out on the page. And I love that idea, this idea that the backstory informs the character's behaviour in the scenario that they are in. And that applies whether we're writing a screenplay or whether we're writing a novel as well. Yeah. So, Maybe a bit that. more indulgent with um, prose, though. Can, can you, isn't it easier to get a bit more backstory across or do you still have to be careful about well, keeping the case you know, going? How, how, do you, how do you give backstory? I mean, Lucy's description of the backstory being kind of invisible, but the characters in their behaviour... I mean, someone once said, and I think it is really a good one, that um, if that McKee, who, who, I, who I, I don't disagree with all the time, but McKee said character is plot, plot is character. And I think what he meant was that what happens happens because of who the characters are. Yeah. And who the characters are goes back to their childhood mm -hmm. and all the shit that happened to them before the action is in the movie the question is is unless you understand their psychological makeup then it's not going to play out properly so beware of thinking that oh i can have the character sitting having a cup of coffee and telling somebody how they were abused as a child because it can be very boring yep if if it's if if in effect if you get into doing that, you're risking exposition, which we all agree, I think, is non-dramatic. You're risking flashbacks, taking the audience away from what is actually happening now. You know, flashbacks can be used really well, but they're also dangerous and risky. Um, you can do it by using voiceover which is also difficult to use well and is very often clunky. Very often voiceover and flashback are used by inexperienced writers who don't know any other way mm -hmm. of kind of trying to make sure that the audience understands what's going on. Great writers know who the characters are before they start writing. Uh, you know, um, Brian Finch, this author who wrote the ending that makes me cry, um, He's, he, I used to be very active in the Writers Guild and I, I was trying to deal with a problem. If you know what the Writers Guild produces basic movie deal is, you get 20% for writing the treatment, 40% for writing the first draft, 20% for all the other drafts and 20% on principal photography. And producers used to complain that by the time they, the writer delivered a first draft, they'd had to pay 60% of the writer's fee. And I said, what's the problem? They said, nine times out of 10, 19 times out of 20, the first draft is unusable. And it used to bug me as an agent. I, I, I wanted to find out why, why was this the case? And it, it's the case because... A lot of writers think, well, I'm only going to get 20% for the treatment. I'm not going to spend very long on it. I want to do that first draft. They want to get to the first draft much too early. So I took a poll of our clients. I said, I need to know, when you get commissioned, how much time do you spend on the prose documents before you start screenplay? And the most experienced screenwriter we had spent 80% of his time 
So if it took him six weeks to deliver a TV movie or whatever it was, 80% of that time was not done writing the script. And McKee said the same thing. He said, you, you know, you only need two weeks to write a feature film script. You may need three months to get to the point where you can start writing it. And these people don't make these figures up. They're not just, you know, this sounds good. This is because these are people who've been doing it for years and years and years and years and years. And so starting it too early leads to lousy screenplays. Mm. Um, I, I, was, I, I once came up with a, uh, someone told me, um, I think it's, in my experience, it works really well, but doesn't work for all writers, which is once you've got an idea of your story, you have sort of rough idea of the characters, you know what your genre conventions are, you kind of think, you know, well, I could start writing the screenplay. I would say, don't do this. Take your two main characters or two of your main characters. And imagine that you are a psychiatrist and they come, have come into your consulting room and they're lying on your couch. And um, they're going to tell you the story of the movie entirely from their point of view. And then just write it out. Let it come out like verbal diarrhea, stream of consciousness. And also remember, this is totally confidential. So you can have the character say things about the other character, which aren't actually in the script at all. They're not even in your head at the point. And if you can get into the swing of doing this, I had one client who wrote 70, 70 long pages of stream of consciousness. And at the end of it, she said to me, this is the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. I said, why? She said, because they said things that I'd never even thought about, mm -hmm. about each other and about the storyline. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to admit, and she said the same thing, quite, quite a lot of what they came out with was not usable, was not interesting. But each, each of these kind of psychiatrist couch things came up with absolutely fascinating ideas that hugely enriched the storytelling. Mm -hmm. Because when you've got, you know, the protagonist bitching away about the antagonist or the other way around, stuff comes out. Now, writer, where, where do writers get their ideas from? Where do they get their knowledge of characters? One of the reasons why, you know, 18-year-olds tend to write very superficial screenplays or novels is because they haven't lived enough. They haven't had enough life experience to refract into characters who are going to be read by people aged 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, who've had vastly more life experience. And therefore you need to, if particularly if you're young, you need to dig deeper into it. So to me, the real subject to study if you're going to be a storyteller is not books on writing novels or books on writing screenplays, but it's psychology. If you, if you, you know, if someone said to me, I want to be a screenwriter, which university or film school shall I go to? I would say go to whichever university offers the best course on psychology, mm. on human psychology. Go and study abnormal behavior because that's what your characters are going to do if they're going to be interesting and there are now when i wrote my book 30 years ago there was nothing on emotion in characters and stories fortunately now there are a number of very good books mm. um but you're writing about people you know i don't care whether a screenplay has no acts in it at all if it's a, if it's a compelling story and i'm emotionally gripped by the predicament of the character, we can, you know, we can fix everything else. But it's, it's, it's being able to write those characters who are completely believable, who are very accessible, with whom you become enormously emotionally engaged so that you've got to, you can't stop reading. You've got to get to the end of the script or the end of the novel. Mm -hmm. That's what's difficult. And you don't do that by reading, you know, God bless him, Robert McKee.
<laughs> okay, well, we're at 10 past eight already. We've been talking wow. for England. But can we have some questions from the audience? Are there any? Yes, we do have some, some questions from the audience. Uh, Rachel is worried about seeming pretentious if she's mixing POVs and structures and stuff in her novels. I mean, personally, I don't think that's necessarily an issue. I, I mix POVs all the time, you know, and, and I'll write in present simple versus, um, you know, past continuous and all that other kind of stuff in different, you know, from different uh you know third person first person all that kind of stuff i've done i've done all of that in in one book before uh but i mean what are your opinion what's your opinion on that julian do you think that's okay um you know if i'm mean, this is a cop-out answer it's okay if it works i think there's a lot more latitude in writing novels mm -hmm. um and if if you're if you have a particular style that involves uh changing povs it depends whether it works or not. Um, my my advice would be, you know, to write um, a, a chapter or two or a short story mm -hmm. using your changing POVs. Give it to lots of people to read. You know, post or post online. Another good reason for having a website: stick things online. Tell people you've written it, and ask for their comments. You know, be prepared to. I mean, I've always said that that I admire writers because you put your you know, your heart and soul into writing and then people who don't have as much talent as you go and trample all over it. Yeah. And you've got to be pretty thick skinned. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, you can always remind yourself that generally speaking, you know, they don't write fiction either. So what do they know? Um, uh, so I don't really have an answer to that. I, I don't think I don't think you should worry too much about it unless people read your stuff and say, you know, I'm finding it confusing. If anyone finds it confusing, you have a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree you, with that. Definitely. Do you switch do you switch povs within the same chapter or do you like stick to one per chapter? I tend to stick to one per chapter, but I have done mixed chapters before in like a Rashomon effect. So like, for example, there's a the first time in the in the coven when everybody sees like the magic explode we see it from various different characters povs in one chapter because it's like a big event it's a set piece so i think i think it's it's very much one of those how long is a piece of string kind of scenario Listen, as long as you make it clear as long as the reader is clear about who's talking or who's thinking or who's mm -hmm. seeing whatever it is that's being seen i mm -hmm. think it'll be fine i don't think you should worry about it yeah yeah, no, I think it should be fine too. Uh, Nick asks, what is the script that reduced Julian to tears? He absolutely must know. <laughs> uh, it's called Good as Gold. It was a BBC TV movie. Okay. I'm going to have to go and look for that now as well. I mean, it's got to be 30 plus years old. Mm -hmm. I'd be surprised if you can find it. I'm trying to, Paul Finch is Brian's son. Mm -hmm. And Paul and I have been talking about Paul doing a contemporaneous i.e. an updated version of it it's a beautiful story mm -hmm. you know oh, i love i love paul's work i mean that mm -hmm. that very gruesome crime novel that you were talking about earlier is was it called stalkers that it was the yeah yeah, yeah it's called stalkers and it was the um first installment of the of the nice guys club that's uh, right and of course the nice guys club highly misogynistic racist horrible people who stalk people and do horrendous things to people way ahead of its time i thought yeah, yeah i think great. i think that the editors of the mainstream publishers mm -hmm. just didn't know how to deal with it no. and i bless i bless avon for having taken a, a punt on him yeah, yeah all right what what's the next question um, Catherine asks, do you think it's harder for novelists to move into screenwriting or screenwriting? Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, screenwriting is highly technical mm -hmm. and and is 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 something that I, I wouldn't recommend to, you know, to anybody uh, until you've proved yourself to be a great storyteller. Um, you know, you don't learn to write scripts by watching movies. No. You know, it's a it's it's like learning a foreign language. Uh, and so I would say it's 10 times easier to write good prose than to write a good script. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think I think that's probably fair. Certainly novelists do seem to um, uh, when I've worked with them, when they're working on adapting their their own novels to, into screenplays, they do really struggle with like kind of boiling the story down into the technical aspects. And yeah, I, I mean, the, the agent point of view is when a novelist says, you know, uh, someone wants to buy my novel, I'd love to have a go at the script is to say what you really want is a much better screenwriter than you to do it. Mm, mm. You know, uh, this is what I normally say to young writer directors who say, you know, would, would, would we represent them? And I say, well, probably not because you're going to write the script. So no one's going to pay for the script. So I can't get any commission out of that. Mm. And, you know, uh, do you really think you're any good as a writer? Mm. Because if you think you're a good script writer, then you should want a better director than yourself to direct it. And if you're any good as a director, why would you want to, to, to direct a script written by you? Because you're not as good a screenwriter. You, you should always remember you're only as good as what you're weakest at. Mm. And if you're a good novelist, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, try and adapt your own script okay. until you've actually written a number of scripts and had some of them produced. Mm. Okay, so uh, let's have a last question. And then I think you've got one more question yourself, haven't you, Mark? And then we can call it a night for tonight. Um, so Kate's asking, how do people get three or four books written a year? Because it's it's blowing her, it blows a lot of people's minds, the thought of writing that many books. I, I usually write two or three books a year, but I don't tend to publish two or three yeah, books. Yeah, but you're manic. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, it... As I said earlier, if you're writing a 160 page novel um, and you work um, on it every day, um, you know, you can write and you can write 160 pages in four weeks. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, it's not that on day one you start working out the storyline and the characters. You have to have all that worked out. And one of the reasons why the people who are doing this tend to use the same central character, the same, you know, police station or precinct uh, is because they only have to work all that out once. It may take you three months mm -hmm. to work out the, you know, who the character, the, the, the repeating characters are, where they work, where they live, what the structure of the world they're in is. And then you come up with a crime story with a guest character. And um, no two writers are the same. I've got clients, some clients get up at five o'clock in the morning and they write till eight o'clock and then they go to work. I've got some who write at night. You know, I've got, uh, my colleague Conrad is a novelist and he went through a phase where what he did was he worked every month. He would take off a Friday and a Monday and he would tell his family he wouldn't see them for four days. And every month he worked because he needed to immerse himself in it. And, and, and it, so he just worked four days mm. every month. In the intervening period, he would be thinking about what was going to be, what he was going to write in the next four days. Yeah. I mean, I once, one of my, when I was a publisher, one of my authors once said, I'm not, I, I'm not going to take any notice of your notes because you're not a writer. And I said to him, you know, that's your, up to you. And I thought, well, why don't I have a go? So I, I did. I, I took off four days. I wrote, uh, I did research on the first day. I wrote a synopsis on the second, a, sh a short chapter on the third day and a short chapter on the fourth day. I took it to a publisher. Admittedly, I knew the editor's taste and his taste and my taste were identical. And I thought he'd like it. And he, I got a publishing contract. Wow. It took me four days. Now, I never finished the book. Yeah. I got kind of my version of writer's block, which is if you work in publishing and you announce you're going to write a novel, everybody thinks, oh, screw him. He thinks he's better than his authors. And it was actually psychologically really, really, really hard. Um, and eventually I had an, I had a, uh, as an agent, I had an author who, who couldn't come up with a storyline. His publisher kept saying, just give me a bloody storyline. I'll give you a contract. So I gave him my pages. I didn't tell him, 
I'd written them. I said, read this and tell me what you think. Could you write this novel? And he said, yeah, I could. I'd love to. Well, what is it? So I said, well, actually, I wrote it. But I tell you what, I will, I will pay back the publisher the advance so that I own the IP. And then I'll write a letter to you saying you can have the IP for nothing. And the book was published very badly because the central character, he gave the central character the name Schiller. Okay. I walked into a big bookshop to see if they had any copies and couldn't find them in the thriller section. So I went to the reception and said, do you have Schiller by Matthew? I've gone blank on his surname. And they looked it up. So yes, they're two copies. I said, well, I've looked for them. I can't find them. They said, oh, well, you will find them. They're in the philosophy section. Schiller was a German philosopher. Oh, my. All right. So beware of cute titles. Um, so the answer is, you know, uh, you write as fast as you can, as fast as you're good at. And I think that, in my experience, most people writing genre, admittedly genre fiction, can actually do, you know, while having a full-time job, can do five pages a day, three pages, five pages a day. Mm. You know, so if you do that over five days, that's, you know, 20, 25 pages. Uh, if your book is 250 pages, uh, you know, that's 10 weeks. Mm. But you have to know who the characters are. You can't do it until you know who your characters are. What happens happens because of who they are. If you don't know that, then how can you tell the story? Yes, it's true. I mean, we don't read books or watch movies or watch TV about characters. We watch them about characters who do something for some reason. And that's what we invest in, that journey with the characters. Well, the, the, you're right. The investment, though, is you're watching the characters. But actually, if you have been made by the brilliance of the writer to identify emotionally with the characters, then you're watching yourself. You're, you're looking at it and you're seeing how would I behave and how would I deal with this? That's the gold dust. Yeah. Now, if we're going to end, when Mark and I started talking about this, um, we thought it might be cool to set up a group of people who want to write novels, I think whether they self-publish or not, uh, but a group of screenwriters wanting to write novels. And so I'd be up for doing another session with Lucy like this. And I think it might be cool to also maybe see if Chris at the London Screenwriters Festival would let us have a session on this at the festival. And we can have, you know, a daily meeting at the festival for an hour. We can find a room somewhere, assuming the festival is going to happen uh, face to face. Um, and do look up that 20 books to 50K. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think if we, if there's some way we can set up a Facebook group of, you know, screenwriters mm -hmm. uh, writing prose, yeah. uh, we'll find we, it's very incredibly helpful. I will learn a lot from it. I need to learn much more from Lucy about how you, you know, self-publish and self, particularly the promotional side of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, Mark, can we leave you to try and come up with some kind of proposal? Yeah. yeah. And Lucy, do we have a record of everyone who was on this? Um, we have a record of all the people that have commented. Um, so, but I can always send out. Okay. Well, look, everybody who hasn't commented, if you, you want more information about what we're going to do going forward, please make sure Lucy knows. Yeah. Just leave, just drop a, just drop a high or a, or a, or a heart or a smiley face in the chat. And I'll I mean, let's just call it something kind of cute, like script to prose, mm -hmm. um, you know, or someone can come up with a better title and let's see what we build up. You know, I mean, I, I really like what Bob does on his Sunday morning thing. I'm not saying we should do one every week, but if people really want to and there are enough people, then then that's fine, because if you're busy, you just don't you don't join that that particular group. Uh, but we're not in competition with Bob. We're just inspired by him. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so should we leave it there for tonight then, fellas? Yep. Uh, Thanks for all the questions. Yes. Thanks for attending. Yep. Thanks, well, Lucy and Mark, for setting this up. 
no problem and thank you for joining us um julian i really appreciate it we're gonna go now guys i'm gonna stop the live stream but i'll say goodbye to you in the and i'm going to have dinner yeah me too okay so thanks so much everyone I'm gonna do zoom wave bye bye bye, bye.